Hey there, fellow sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. On today's episode, after delving into the sophisticated philosophical arguments in favor of abortion, we now turn to the somewhat less nuanced but no less potent common arguments in favor of abortion, like this one. I'm killing I'm killing her! I'm killing the baby! Makes you think. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll be your layman today as we appropriate some culture. Alrighty, so we've already established the basic pro-life argument as a simple deductive argument, which is, all human embryos and fetuses are innocent human beings. Intentionally killing an innocent human being is murder. Murder is wrong. Therefore, killing a human embryo or fetus is wrong. The logic is sound internally, so any successful counter-argument has to demonstrate that one of the premises is false. And that's a good thing to keep in mind when you're dealing with pro-abortion advocates, because if you're paying attention, you'll notice that most of the time, they don't even attempt to address the premises, which is to say, they don't even an attempt to address the pro-life argument at all. Exhibit A. Well, Jesus was 33 when he died. Is your mother still around? I think you seem to be having difficulty grasping the triune nature of God. Father and Son are very good and helpful descriptions to allow us to understand the depths of God's love and the degree of the sacrifice, but Jesus is God, so he's in on the plan. Jesus says in John, The reason my Father loves me is that I laid down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. There also might be a slight difference between sacrificing your son to atone for the sins of the whole world and save the lives of many, and aborting your child because you want to go on all the rides at Six Flags. Slight difference. Also, Jesus was raised back to life again, so if you can raise your aborted baby back to life, maybe we'll talk. But until then, perhaps we should leave the God work to someone more qualified. Next. Your you're harming a life. I believe this is life. Well, some religions don't. So how about that? Our Jewish brothers and, f and sisters, they are able to have an abortion according to their faith. You know, there are so many faiths that do not have the same definition of life as fundamentalist Christians. And so we, how, what about their rights? What about their right to exercise their faith? It's ridiculous. And it is, it's, it is theocratic. It's authoritarian. It is wrong. How about that? Okay, so for the record, like all religions, there's different schools of thought on this. Christians are perhaps the most uniform, but there are certainly thought leaders in Orthodox Judaism and Islam that are against abortion from conception. Some Muslims put the limit at 120 days, others put it at 40 days of gestation, but permissibility is not the same as necessity, meaning Islam and Judaism may permit abortion up to a certain point, but they don't require abortion. It's not a sacrament. The religion does not compel or require it. And so banning it in our country is not a violation of their religious freedom because it's not a religious practice. Or let's put it this way. Islam permits a man to marry up to four wives. In the United States of America, we do not permit that. Is that a violation of religious freedom? Is AOC in favor of polygamy? Or is she being theocratic and authoritarian? How about that? Permissibility is not the same as necessity. You can be a perfectly good Muslim living out your faith and your religion to the fullest with one wife and zero abortions. That we might have different laws and views on marriage and abortion does not hinder their practice of religion. What's more, though, there are limits even on religious freedom, especially if the religious practice violates the moral law. 
You look through history and you see all kinds of religious rituals that involve child sacrifice, virgin sacrifice, human sacrifices in general, cannibalism, and to those religious practices we rightly say, no, you can't, you can't do that. Your religion stinks. Not all religious practices are permitted in this country, nor should they be. Are we being theocratic and authoritarian? Next. So, so abortion should be allowed then, by your definition, for any reason, for any purpose, at any stage, right? I trust people to make decisions about their body, and then when relevant, I think that they need to consult their medical practitioners okay. and not is, Congress. If it is, listen, let me just ask you this question. If it is not lawful and morally acceptable to take the life of a 10-year-old child, I assume you agree with that, right? That would be wrong, correct? I believe that Okay, that is and wrong. a two-year-old child, same thing, that would be murder, we would all agree that's wrong. Then what is the principal distinction between the human being that is two years old, or nine months old, or one week old, or an hour old, than one that is eight inches further up the birth canal in the utero? What, what's the difference? Why is it okay in the latter case and not the former cases? I trust people to determine what to do with their own bodies. Wow. The very obvious and glaring problem with the my body, my right position is that what we're concerned about is something that is in fact not your body. It's somebody else's body. This living organism has different DNA than yours. It has its own fingerprints and blood type and maybe a totally different gender than you. It's not your limbs that are being dismembered. It's not your skull that is being crushed. It's not your brain that is being sucked into a sink. It's not your heart that is being stopped. It's what you're doing to someone else's body that is our cause for concern. But here's this inanity lived out to the full. Do you believe in abortion after birth? Would you, would you support that? I believe in whatever the woman wants to choose to do, that's her choice. At any point of the child's life? At any point of the lady's life, that's her choice to kill another person's body. It's going to always be her choice. Even after the baby's born? It's always her choice. So if they're two years old? It's always her choice. I can kill my two-year-old. It's a woman's right to choose. To kill their child at any point. It's a woman's right to choose. You must have a really good relationship with your mother. Okay, but what about rape and incest? Well, this might be controversial, but I'm against both. I mean, call me a prude, but I think both should be against the law. But you'll hear cases of rape and incest being used to justify abortions, and here's where it's particularly useful to go back to our deductive argument. Does the objection of rape and incest address any of the premises? No, it's not addressing the pro-life argument at all. It's obfuscating and appealing to emotion. So on a practical, strategic level, here's the best way to handle that. They called is candidly and openly calling for a nationwide ban on all abortions with no exceptions for rape or incest. And if I've got that wrong, I would invite Ms. Foster to correct me. Do I have it wrong, yes or no? Um, if we added rape and incest exceptions, would you vote for it? Uh, okay, I, I reclaim my time, of course. I reclaim my time! It's a totally disingenuous argument, as that clearly demonstrates. Again, according to Planned Parenthood's own statistical source, less than 1% of abortions are due to rape or incest. So as a practical matter, as a matter of public policy, if we outlaw abortion except for instances of rape and incest, we would eliminate 99.9% .9 of all abortions in this country. As a pro-lifer, I'd take that deal. With the pro-choice side, no. So let's stop pretending that this has anything to do with rape or incest. Now that's pragmatically, but when it comes to logic, rape and incest doesn't counter the deductive argument. It makes no attempt to. And as a matter of morality, I don't think you kill the sons for the sins of the father. I read that somewhere. Next. They understand that an embryo, that a zygote, that a non-viable fetus is not the same as an actual baby, okay? A viable baby is a life that can survive outside of the mother's womb, okay? Very different. Viability, okay, so what premise does viability address? 
Ostensibly, it's addressing premise number one. They're not human beings because they're not viable. Well, what do we mean by viable? Do you mean that they can survive on their own outside the womb? Have you met a baby? They can't do anything on their own. They can't feed themselves, clothe themselves, bathe themselves, change themselves. You set an infant down and walk away, that's a dead baby. They are completely and totally dependent on others for survival. What do you mean by viable? They can breathe on their own? You're not human unless you can breathe on your own? If you're on oxygen, f you. And don't get me started on these guys on ventilators. <sighs> Less than human clumps of cells. Now, there's all kinds of situations and circumstances in which human beings can't survive on their own and need external intervention. People need all kinds of things to survive. Medication, insulin, feeding tubes, dialysis. Are they not human? The problem with viability is, as soon as we try to apply a standard to it, it suddenly disregards whole segments of humanity that we absolutely regard as human. Even as simplistic of a standard as gestational survivability is a constantly changing mark. The earliest premature baby to survive is Curtis Means, born at 21 weeks. Still on oxygen, though. <laughs> But as technology improves, survivability is only going to get better and better. There's a ton of work being done on artificial wombs, and we've clearly seen the progress of that. What wasn't viable even 50 years ago is viable now with the advancements of medical technology. So depending on when you're conceived, one is human and one is not, even if you're at the same stage of development. And not only that, but where you're conceived also matters. Premature babies born in, say, the Republic of Chad don't have the same degree of viability as premature babies born here. So premature babies in Chad are less human? Or don't develop into humans as quickly? Viability is not a good standard for humanness. The degree to which you're human really shouldn't be conditioned on technology. You know, I wasn't human and then the iPhone 17 came out. Still, I think perhaps the biggest issue with viability when it comes to abortion is that it completely disregards prognosis. Now, viability makes some sense. I, I get it if you're dealing with someone who is brain dead, right? They're on machines, but they're dead. I get it. Go ahead and unplug them because they're not really alive. However, if we knew with a scientific certainty that all we had to do was nothing and given time there would be brain waves. If all we had to do was just leave the brain-dead patient alone hooked up to those machines, and nine months later, with a scientific certainty, we knew that the brain-dead patient would make a full recovery and walk out that hospital, well then, don't unplug them. What are you, nuts? The prognosis really changes the viability. Look, I know he's going to be totally fine a few months from now, but at the moment he's brain-dead, so yoink! That's messed up. Anyway, we'll stop there today. As always, if you like what we're doing here, we ask that you like, subscribe, rate, and review. You can also follow me on the major socials. Join my author's Facebook page. That's going to be pretty important coming up. And I will see you next week for more Appropriate in the Culture. Mm -hmm.